Would you take your Bibles, please? Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. We'll begin in verse 21. While you're turning, let me say first of all, thank you for being here today. In most Baptist churches, if you announce you're going to preach on prayer, a lot of people go to the deer woods. I'm kind of laughing, but it's very true. It's one of those topics that a lot of people say, I'm afraid to go hear about prayer, I might feel guilty. So the first thing I want to say about our study this week is this, and about especially this sermon this morning. It would be very easy to preach these verses and put a guilt trip on you. But that's not going to happen. I'm not here today to make you feel guilty. Now, if the Holy Spirit convicts you, that's something different. But that won't be coming from me. The purpose of this message is not to make you feel guilty. I want to remind you that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, and that He is our Master Teacher, our Rabbi, and that everyone who's saved is called to be a disciple, and it's the job of a disciple to become like the Master. So we're going to look at some scriptures that deal with times and places and ways that Jesus prayed, because this is going to set a pattern for what we're supposed to be doing in our lives. And I have a very simple question for you right now. It's one maybe you've never answered, but I've heard some people answer it the wrong way. Here's my question. Did Jesus really need to pray? Well, He was God. He's God in the flesh. He didn't need... Yes, He did. Jesus Christ needed to pray. And not only can I not become like Him if I don't pray, I need to pray even more than He did. And so do you. So let's begin. Luke chapter 3, verse 21. When all the people were baptized, John the Baptist was baptizing, and people were coming from everywhere to be baptized at the Jordan River. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized, and while he prayed, did you catch that? During his baptism, Jesus was praying. During his baptism, not only was Jesus praying, and while he prayed, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You're my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. Not only was Jesus praying during his baptism, the Father was saying, I am proud of you. I'm pleased with you. You're doing right. But read one more statement. Now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age, he began his what? His public ministry. How did Jesus Christ begin his public ministry? He began it with baptism. That was his public announcement. I am the Son of God. And that was God's public announcement. This is my Son. And Jesus heard it. And John the Baptist heard it. Others heard it thunder, but at least those two understood the words. His baptism was his public announcement. I'm beginning my ministry. Why was he praying? He's praying, Father, I'm not coming to do my will. I'm coming to do your will. Here's my life. Use me for your glory. It's time for me to publicly announce that I'm not just another man. I'm the Son of God. When I was a pastor and I had the privilege of baptizing anyone, I always tried to teach them to pray during their baptism. And I would ask them to pray something like this. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Here's my life. I'm beginning my public life for you, Lord. I want to serve you. Not my will. Your will be done. Everyone I baptized, I never saw the heavens opened. 
I never heard the Father say, but in everyone who prayed during their baptism, the Holy Spirit always spoke to them. And the Holy Spirit let them know, I'm proud of you. You're my child. You're my child. Now, as soon as Jesus had been baptized, we find the Holy Spirit thrust him out into the wilderness. Look at chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan. He was led, he was thrust by the Spirit in the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days and nights. And in those days, he ate nothing. He was not dieting. He was going without food so he could spend that time in prayer. He was ignoring his physical needs, the needs of his physical body, so that he could feed his spiritual body with prayer and the Word of God. And so 40 days he spends in intense prayer. He's made his public announcement I'm beginning my public life for the Father, and then he immediately leads the public, and he goes through this period of testing, and Satan tests him for 40 days and nights as he's praying. But notice what it says in verse 14. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, And the news about him went throughout all the surrounding regions. He taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was pleased. Why? The power came through the prayer. The power came through the Holy Spirit who blessed him because of the prayer. Why do we not have more power in our churches today? We're not letting the Spirit work through prayer. We're trying to do it with man-made means. We're trying to copy the methodology of the world. We don't need the methodology of the world. We have the Holy Spirit. We have God the Father. We have God the Son. We have God the Holy Spirit. All we need to do is learn to pray and be obedient. Study the Word and obey the Word. And so... Jesus begins his ministry with a power that comes to his life through prayer. Turn to Luke 24, last chapter of Luke. Luke chapter 24. We'll begin in verse 50. Jesus had died on the cross. Jesus rose from the dead. After his resurrection, he spent 40 days teaching, walking on this earth. Then in verse 50, this takes place. He led them out as far as Bethany. He lifted up his hands and he blessed them. He did what? He blessed them. What do you do if you bless someone? You ask God to do something good for them. Isn't that what we do when we bless someone? Jesus spoke to the Father and ask a blessing on those he was leaving behind. So he led them out as far as Bethany. He lifted up his hands. He blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. So what is the last thing Jesus did before he got to heaven? He was praying for us. Praying for those at that time right then. Where is Jesus at today? He's at the right hand of the Father. He's our great high priest. He ever liveth to make intercession for the saints. He's still praying for us today. So Jesus began his ministry in prayer, and Jesus ended his ministry in prayer. Do you think he forgot about prayer in between the beginning and the ending? I don't think so. I don't think so. Turn back to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, verse 16. So he, Jesus, so he himself, he often, it's his habit, it's his custom, 
It's not a once in a while deal. He often withdrew into the wilderness and he prayed. Why would he go into the wilderness? He had to get alone with the Father. He had to get away from the crowds. He had to get away from the friends. He had to get away from all other people and just spend time alone with the Father. He made it his habit. And if you study the life of Jesus in the four Gospels, many times he went to mountains to pray. Many times he went to the desert to pray. Many times he just found a place somewhere. Let's take an example, and it will add to this. Turn with me to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. While you're turning there, let me ask you this. Where do you go to pray? Do you have a place? Do you have some places where you can be alone? The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said you can go to your closet, you can go to your small room, you can go to the wilderness, you can go to the mountains. Where can you go in your life so that you can be alone with the Lord and spend some quality time in prayer. You say, well, I can pray while I'm driving. That's good while you're driving. I pray while I'm driving too. Don't bow your head and close your eyes, though. (laughs) Yeah. You can pray a lot of places in my life. Places become very special to me, just an ordinary place. In our house, if you come in the front door and you go straight and a little bit left, there's the main living room. If you turn to the right, there's kind of a formal dining room, but we don't make it very formal. It does have a real long table on it we love. We had made over in Van Buren. And that table and that little area that doesn't get used hardly for anything else in our... You know, when we have special occasions... If we have family, we use that room. Rest time, we eat in the kitchen, we eat in the living room, like everybody else. But that place is a place, and my wife is a workaholic. Right now, my wife has three jobs. She retired from school teaching. She got three jobs. So she loves to work. So if I'm home from a conference, chances are I'm going to have a time where I can go to that table and she's going to be at work. The kids are grown. They're gone. And that has become a precious place to me. It wasn't until God started waking me up in the middle of the night. In the middle of the night, I'd wake up, and I wouldn't be able to get back to sleep. I'd sleep maybe four or five hours. I'd wake up. And I thought, it's no use trying to go back to sleep right now. I need to get up and do something worthwhile. And the Spirit said, that's why I woke you up. It's time to pray. And that became a precious time to pray. Two or three o'clock in the morning. Go spend a good amount of time in prayer. You know what I found out? If I had a good prayer time, I could go right back to bed and go right back to sleep. And then I found out, hey, I could try this early in the morning when I get up too. Just go to the table and pray. Or sometimes if she's gone to work in the middle of the afternoon, just go to the table. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's the middle of the night. It doesn't matter if it's early in the morning. It doesn't matter when it is. Just go. Go spend that time in prayer. So I ask you, where are you going to pray? You need a place. Jesus had one. Mark chapter 1. Let's begin in verse 32. Jesus had come back to Capernaum. He had preached that morning in the synagogue. He cast out a demon. And after he cast out the demon in the synagogue, he goes back to Simon Peter's house, found out his mother-in-law was ill, so he heals her. Word got out that Jesus had healed Peter's mother-in-law. Not only had he cast out demons, he could heal. And suddenly you find that everybody is saying, as soon as the sun goes down, we're going to Peter's house. Why didn't they go before the sun? It was a Sabbath. 
They couldn't carry any people because that would be working on the Sabbath, they said. So they waited till the sun went down, the Sabbath was over. As soon as the sun went down, the whole town shows up at Simon Peter's door and Jesus comes out and he ministers to person after person after person after person and as he ministers to them, the power goes out from him to heal them. Finally, the last one's taken care of. Late, late at night. And we get to verse 35. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and he departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. When did he go? A long while before daylight. Where did he go? A place to be alone to pray. And Simon, those who were with him, searched for him. When they found him, they said, everyone's looking for him. Why did he get up so early? He knew everyone was looking for him. They would be there at sunrise. They would be knocking on the door. Jesus, we want you. Jesus, do this for us. And so in order to be prepared to minister the next day, what did he do? He went to that solitary place and he prayed and he allowed the Holy Spirit to re-energize him. Everyone's looking for you. He said to them, let's go to the next towns. I may preach there also. And he goes and ministers again. Now, I had one deacon one time to church, and this deacon loved to tell everybody how early up in the morning he got up to pray. He would get up at four every morning to pray. Before he'd go to work, he'd spend an hour in prayer. And uh, the guy would challenge me to do it with him one month out of the year. So for one month out of the year, I would get up, and the two of us would meet, and we'd pray together. He'd like to kill me. I am not a great early riser. I would be more of a night owl than an early riser. He'd say, Jesus got up a long while before daylight to pray, Brother Mike. You've got to get up and pray a long while before daylight if you want to be spiritual. Oh, man. People in our church didn't like him because of that. <laughs> well... Turn with me to Matthew 14. I've got good news for night owls. Matthew 14. Good news for night owls. Jesus has sent the twelve out, and they've come back rejoicing that the demons are under their power. And at the same time they get word John the Baptist has been beheaded, so now they've got these great emotions going, and, and they've got this grief going at the same time. Do your emotions ever get mixed up? As a pastor, it happens. You see great things happening, you see terrible things happening, and they all happen at the same time. That was happening with Jesus and the apostles. So he says, let's get in the boat, let's go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and when we get there, we're just going to spend some time resting and, and talking, and we're going to rest up. Well, some people see him get in the boat, and they're up by the northern tip of the Sea of Galilee, so a crowd starts developing, and they run around the lake. So when he gets to the other side, there are 5,000 men, not counting the women and the children. So you know the story. He has compassion on the multitude. He feeds them with the five loaves and two fishes. And it comes evening, he sends them home. Has he had any time with the apostles? No, he hasn't. So he tells the apostles, you guys get in the boat. And you head back across. It tells all the people, go home. Go home. And then this is what happens. Look at verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get in the boat and go before him the other side, for he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. Let's not worry about the boat right now. Let's not worry about the apostles. 
What time of morning was it? Fourth watch of the night. It's between 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock in the morning. The earliest it is, is 3 o'clock in the morning. And he hasn't gone to sleep yet. He sent the crowds away, and it's not even sundown. He climbs the mountain and watches the sunset while he's praying, and he prays, and he prays, and he prays till at least 3 o'clock in the morning. Then he walks on the water. So what I want to say to you is that Jesus began his days with prayer, and Jesus ended his days with prayer. And I'm not talking about, now I lay me down to sleep. He prayed. He prayed. So if you're an early riser, then hit it hard in the morning. If you're a night owl, hit it hard at night. But we have no excuse. We can be like Jesus one way or the other, can't we? So... He does this. Look at Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Verse 12. Luke chapter 6. Now it came to pass in those days. Let me wait a minute and give you a chance to get there. I get in a hurry sometimes. Luke chapter 6, verse 12. Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountains to pray. Not the same mountain, different mountains. He continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles. Why did he pray all night long? He had an important decision. He's got hundreds and hundreds of disciples, but only twelve of them get to be apostles. He's got to choose the right twelve. So he prays all night long, and then he makes his choice, and I believe he got it right. He got it right. Someone asks you, do you pray about decisions? Or do you pray after your decision's been made? Too many people make their decision, and then they ask God to bless it. There have been a whole lot of churches make decisions and then ask God to bless those decisions. That's getting the cart before the horse. We're supposed to pray and let God show us how to make the decisions. And sometimes that takes a while. Sometimes that takes intense prayer. And Jesus spent all night in prayer. You say, preacher, I can't pray all night. Of course we can't. You know why? Because that has to be learned. It has to be learned over time. It's just like walking. You didn't just pick up one day and start walking. You had to develop your muscles. You had to learn to crawl. You had to learn to stand up. You had to learn to get your balance. You had to learn to take a step and fall. You had to learn how to do it. And finally you got where you could walk. And it's that way with prayer. You got to start small. You got to start regular. You've got to start just growing here and here and here. And after a while, you get where you can pray for 10 minutes and it really feels good. And then you'll get after a while, you get where you can pray 20 minutes. And you don't lose your focus. You keep your mind on the things of God. And you just keep at it and you keep at it. But it takes spiritual exercise. Quite frankly, we're just too lazy when it comes to prayer. We don't want to work at it. Now sometimes prayer is really fun. Look at Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Tells us in verse 1. Luke chapter 10, verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also. He sent them two by two before His face into every city and place where himself was to go. Look at verse 17. Then the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. 
He said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven. You've hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. And I want you to know that was one of the easiest prayers that Jesus ever had ever prayed. That was a delightful prayer. It was spontaneous. It was full of joy. He rejoiced in his spirit. God was using those he sent out. And he is full of joy when he prays it. Man, there's sometimes when you pray and it's glory. It just feels like you're you're ready for heaven. But look at Luke 22. Luke 22, verse 39. Luke 22, verse 39. Coming out. He went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed. You see, that was one of his favorite places to pray, was the Mount of Olives, a Gethsemane. And the disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. He was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. He knelt down and he prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Sometimes prayer is full of joy. And sometimes prayer is the most difficult thing you can do in life. Sometimes your heart is broken to pieces and your emotions are shattered and physically and mentally and spiritually it's battle. It's warfare to pray. God help me pray. Jesus experienced that. And so will we if we follow in His steps. Jesus prayed for others in this same chapter. Look up at verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith shall not fail. And when you've returned to me, strengthen your brothers. Peter, Jesus knows he's going through all this agony in prayer, but before he agonizes for himself in prayer, he prays for Peter. Quickly, look at John 17, verse 1. John 17, verse 1. Before he got to the Garden of Gethsemane, while he was still in Jerusalem, he prayed these words. Jesus spoke these words. He lifted up his eyes to heaven. He didn't bow his head and close his eyes when he prayed. He lifted up his eyes to heaven. He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son also may glorify you, as you've given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you've given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. I've glorified you on the earth. I've finished the work you've given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus prayed for others, and he prayed for himself. Every once in a while I run into a believer who says, I never pray for myself. I just pray for others. Be careful. Be careful. You need 
to pray for yourself. Then there's three last prayers we know of Christ. There's a lot more than what we've covered. But the three last are on the cross. Remember when they were putting the nails in his hands, what did he pray? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. His second prayer on the cross, he quoted Scripture. He quoted the 22nd Psalm, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The Old Testament Psalm of a righteous man suffering unjustly, crying out in agony, but keeping his trust in the Father. It's a prayer of faith. His last prayer was, It is finished, Father, in your hands I commit my spirit. And he quoted Psalm 41.6. He laid down his life. Jesus needed to pray. So do we. Now here's where this Bible conference is going to be different. I hope this motivates you to see that every one of us here today can get better at prayer. There's a, not a one of us here that are born again believers that we cannot get better in prayer. And I want to challenge you this week to get better in prayer. And beginning tonight, we're going to learn how to do it. We're not just going to challenge you to do it. We're going to learn the nuts and bolts. How do you do worship prayer? How do you do intercessory prayer? How do you make prayers and supplications? It's going to be a how-to conference. If you'll come back tonight, I believe God's going to give you something that will really help your prayer life. Now, I know we got a lot of people cannot drive after night. We got people that health wise cannot be here. If you can find somebody to bring you, if you can find somebody to pick you up, you come back too. Some of you can't, I realize. If you can be here, you'd be here. Now, the last thing I want to say I've been talking to believers. If you're here today and you're not a believer, you're not a child of God, Give me just about a minute and a half. Are you ready? Can a lost person pray? I was always taught they couldn't. Here's what I believe now. Only a person who knows Jesus Christ can pray Father. Only a born-again believer can pray Father. A lost person can pray God. Right? And the most important prayer you can pray is this. God, I know I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. God, I know you sent your son Jesus Christ. He died in my place on the cross. He's the only one who can save me. God, I know if I die before I go to heaven, without, if I die without receiving Christ, I won't go to heaven. I'll be judged. And I'll go to hell. God, would you change me? Would you help me repent of my sin and change my life? Give me eternal life. And when you pray that prayer, God will give you a new birth. He'll do it. Amen? Would you stand with me, please? If the Holy Spirit moves in your heart, you come obeying. 
We're going to sing, change our, my heart, O oh God. And you let him change you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that we could be here today. We want to glorify you. Thank you, God, that you're the God who answers prayers. What an awesome God you are. Thank you for being our Father. You don't just answer, you answer as a loving Father to those who love you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, speak now. Let your Spirit draw. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.